Greetings, my fellow nerds. I'm Chris. And I'm Michelle. And this is D's Nerds, and this is What Are We Watching, number 15. So as usual, we have a lot of movies to go over here. And Michelle, I really just want you to kick off, because I know you have some old standbys that we just had to watch again, huh? Yes. <laughs> because it's been back to school time and when back to school time comes Michelle goes in the comfort mode which means of course that we had to watch da, 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 da. The Hobbit on my shiny new 4k steelbooks and and how good do those look for you now they're really pretty they really are I know there's a lot of talk about you know that they look different and you know whether or not they're true to the original source and well, that's true, that's also why we have the Blu-rays to look back on as well, because they do look very pretty to these eyes. They do, and I, I mean, they look really nice, and so on that, we also watched Lord of the Rings. We still have half of Return of the King left, because I've been waiting for the day when I really, really need it. Um, <laughs> She's really holding on to I it. I am, because I know once we watch it, it'll be a while before we watch it again. <laughs> and then you also went back and we rewatched something else, didn't we? We may or may not have watched Harry Potter again. I think we watched it twice through really close together, and he's really nice for letting me do it because I'm sure he was really tired of it. I think by the time we'd gotten back to uh, to the Deathly Hollows, that had been like you know the second time maybe in like a couple of weeks or three weeks that I'd watched that movie. So it was a little interesting, but at the same time, I know that time of year is real stress, really stressful for you. So you know that that's comfort. So we'll take care of you. And I've also been reading the books along with it again this time too. So I'm in the middle of Deathly Hollows reading it right now. Yeah. So what can I say? Harry Potter. Comforts you, does it not? It does, because I'm a homebody at Hogwarts. Of course. There you go. <laughs> this is one we actually watched last night, which um, I was very interested for you to watch this because I watched it by myself whenever I got it several months ago and thought it was really good. And I was like, okay, you know, Michelle, I don't think Michelle will hate this very much. Um, but we can also put this in the win column for John Carpenter as well. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, Somebody's Watching Me. Or, nope, Someone's Watching Me. That, somebody's Watching Me is the song. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Yeah. So, Someone's Watching Me. This was actually the... the uh, uh, made for TV film that he shot right before he did Halloween. So hey, I mean this this one I think has a lot of elements of Halloween in it, very much with kind of like the stalker killer kind of angle. Uh, but there's also some like a Hitchcockian kind of stuff in it, and you know I think for a made for TV film it works pretty good. It does, and for me being kind of a, a weenie sometimes about gore and stuff, I can appreciate that there's not any. Um, it's a story without. It's a stalker story, so it's more about like the discomfort of it all more than mm -hmm. anything, and that's always a win in my book. And I definitely am glad to be able to say we can put another win in the John Col John Carpenter column because he and I have had very mixed reviews so far. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it like I said, it does work. It it does feel very TV filmish. Um, you know, so like the feel of it definitely has that, but I think it, the, the rest of the story really shines through and, you know, it's a great cast too. It, you know, a lot of, a lot of great performances. It's just, it's a fun one. So once we got done with Harry Potter and I promised not to make him immediately watch them again, I decided to go back and hit that Fantastic Beasts. Um, I do like these movies. I just, they're, they're not the same to me. I mean, the story is still good and I'm now anxiously awaiting in April. The, the final one in this trilogy is coming out, finally. Finally. I think we just got the announcement of the title today. Yeah, they just came out. It's a fantastic piece, The Secrets of Dumbledore, yeah. which I'm very pumped about. And the logo is cool. It's got like the wand kind of etched into the letter D and stuff. It's pretty nifty. But I'm excited to finally see how this story plays out because I feel like this trilogy is suffering the major middle movie problem, mm. um, which I'll have more to say once we watch that one again. But anyway... Yeah, yeah, I, I like this one, and I thought this one has definitely been the better of the two that have come out so far. Uh, yeah, I had I had issues with Crimes of Grindelwald as well. It's uh, yeah, it definitely suffers from you know middle movie syndrome. But you know, hey, may, you know, if the third one sticks the landing, then of course you know it makes the second one look better anyway. So, it does. So we'll just see what happens. So I subjected Michelle to several comedies that I adored uh, that she had never seen before and this is one of them and uh, I think you like this one. Mostly. Mostly, yeah. We watched Kingpin. Kingpin is awesome in my opinion. Woody Harrelson, Bill Murray, Randy Quaid before he went all crazy and wackadoodle. Um, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's a great sports movie. 
but with a lot of great, you know, comedy going on. I mean, and Bill Murray is just unhinged in this. I mean, he's playing just the super sleazy slime ball, but like slick as all get out, you know, bowling professional. I mean, the champion kind of guy that, that, you know, has a big rivalry with, with Woody Harrelson's character. And, and you know, I just, I don't know. I adore this movie. I remember watching it on Comedy Central a lot as a kid or not as I guess more like a teenager and just really loving it and was really excited to show Michelle and and I, I you liked it well enough that I feel very justified in showing it to you yeah it was good there was definitely a couple parts that I could have lived without though <laughs> I think if you know you know yeah yeah if you know you know I I think for you we, we've kind of talked about this as you get older gore and General grossness. General grossness. You're really kind of becoming less tolerant of, <laughs> whereas I kind of find that I'm kind of enjoying that more and more. I think I'm reverting back to childhood or something, but uh, you know, it's all good. Next up is a steel book that we had picked up in our anniversary trip haul, which is Jumanji from 1995. Mm -hmm. um, this is such a cool box, honestly, that the inside of the box is like the game. So like, look, there's actually the game board underneath the discs and stuff, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, but this is a childhood favorite of mine, especially. So I was really excited to get it on Steelbook and get to watch it in in 4K. I mean, yeah, it's Jumanji. What can you say? And it picture looks great. I mean, and it's just kind of cool to have this version. Uh, we don't we don't really really try to collect Steelbooks, but whenever we do get a nice one, it, it's always cool to have in the collection. So this next one, we we watched part one in our last one we watched. We talked about that, and then of course we had to finish it up by having part two and watching it, and can definitely say that we enjoyed this one as well. Batman, The Long Halloween, part two. Uh, I thought they stuck the landing amazingly. Uh, I will say, compared to the ending of the comic book it is different in that regard slightly but overall it, it stays very true to the overall spirit of that of that story and it works supremely well everything about it is just really great i think putting those two parts together makes one heck of a great animated film and i am just very satisfied with what they did with that book because overall i mean that was that's been my favorite comic book of batman's anyway one of my favorites anyway and so i thought it was just very effective and very well done and uh, i know you love part one mm -hmm. and uh, i know that you had strong feelings about the second one as well yeah i really love this story because it was batman as a detective not Batman just kicking everybody's butt mm -hmm. um, and I had no background in this whatsoever I didn't know what the story was about he just showed me the first one and sometimes with these animated ones I'm kind of like eh like it's okay this one I was so aggravated when we got to the end and I was like where's part two he's like well it's not out yet excuse me <laughs> like I have to wait <laughs> Oh, so, I know you were despondent. You were I like, was. but but we've got to know. <laughs> so we watched that one the minute it came in the mail. <laughs> exactly, and yeah, I think we we had one of these movies we watched before that, and I was like, Michelle, you know, we've got enough time before we go to bed. We could watch Long Halloween. You were like, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's definitely a really good one. Uh, next up is a favorite of ours. We kind of started hitting some of our like spooky season movies now. Mm -hmm. um, so we watched Tremors. <laughs> And it's the pretty 4K Arrow Video Edition that I yes. chronicled on a movie haul way back when. It's absolutely massive. And it is a really great picture. This movie has never looked better. Yeah, it does. It looks really good. And it's such a fun movie. It is. Um, Earl and Val's chemistry in this is just perfect. I think they're one of the great <laughs> on-screen bromances of all time. They really are. I mean, it's just, I mean, it starts off being this kind of like comedy and then it turns into something pretty pretty scary actually when you end up the, the effects work in this is just spectacular uh yeah, i was watching part you were talking about it was a miniature that i had no idea was a miniature yeah like the part where they where they break in to the oh my gosh it's uh Bert's. bert bert and uh reba mcintyre forget her character in that but where the the graboid you know bursts through the wall of their compound and they just they're shooting the, the hell out of it basically and that old where the grab woods like coming through and doing all that crazy stuff that's actually a miniature that's what i watched in one of the documentaries on this and that's another great thing the special features in this edition is amazing but yeah that, that's all miniature work i mean this was before you know cgi really took over and it's just stunning how well this movie's held up 
Yeah, I mean, you don't, I feel like I don't watch this movie and think, oh, that looks dumb, that looks fake. Like, you're just kind of in it. So I think that's always a good sign for whatever effects work that they do if that's not distracting. And it's making me, I, I do love this movie a lot, and I've seen some of the sequels, but you haven't seen anything mm -hmm. regarding that. I am interested to kind of, to pick up, you know, the, the other sequels at some point, or watch the other sequels at some point, and watch them with you, because it does go, it's very interesting in how it is bonkers, but it still works. But aren't Earl and Val not in it, though? They're not in it. See, that hurts my feelings. But Bert's like in it. But Bert's in it. But Bert's not as much fun. Yeah, but Bert eventually, he becomes more fun. <laughs> and he's he's very much in, like, doomsday, kind of into the world, like, bonkers guy here in this one. But he gets more fun. But we'll see how it goes. But, yeah, I mean, this one, can't miss. It's, it's one of the great kind of horror monster kind of films uh, of, of the 90s. This is another comedy that I wanted to show you, and you I, you were very skeptical. I got the feeling that you were just kind of like, what are you having me watch? But then you ended up loving it, did you not? I did. It um, looked like it was going to be really dumb, though. Okay. We watched Airheads. Now, first of all, before we talk about Airheads, I did have, I do have a bone to pick because getting this on physical media has turned out to be a chore and a half. Uh, first of all, the Blu-ray edition came out several years ago, and unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know it had come out, and it went out of print by the time I even knew it existed. So it's out of print. It's going used for like $200, $300 or something. And I'm like, first of all, I love this movie. I don't love this movie that much. I did find a used DVD, and by used, I mean used, uh, very used for like, I think it was like seven bucks. So that's not bad. Um, and it, and it looks pretty decent for, for a DVD, so I can't complain. But you know, seriously, this needs to be put back out on Blu-ray. Make it happen. But anyway, now that I'm beyond that, this is one of my favorite comedies from the nineties and it's absolutely stellar you know another reason to love Brendan Fraser if you didn't need an, any more reasons here's here's another one and he's great in it Adam Sandler is in, in it and he's not playing the typical crazy man child role that he would later become very famous for later on he's a little bit more subdued and it's actually Steve Buscemi that's a lot more off his rocker in this although he's still what less weird than pretty much anything else I've ever seen him in exactly <laughs> so and I mean just and there's other great stuff you know Joe Montaigne is in it and he's killing it uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael McKeon's in it. I mean, you just keep going down the line. Ernie Hudson, Chris Farley's got a great role in that as well. I mean, just great cast. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, if you're any type of musician, uh, you do chuckle at some of this. I mean, it's, you know, it is it is very funny. So, but I know I've kind of said enough and I've talked quite a bit about it. But, you know, your kind of experience walking into it and then what you thought of the film. Sometimes Chris has a bad, bad um, way of selling movies to me, and then he makes them sound like they're terrible, and then I'm going to hate them to start out with, and then I watch them, and I'm like, that wasn't bad. That was I, fun. I try to lower expectations, because the last sometimes thing... Sometimes you do the other, other way, and then I'm like, well, that was stupid. <laughs> what can I say? I don't know. I, I just like what I like, and sometimes it's a piece of dung or sometimes it's pretty good so there you but anyway go. yes that was a really fun movie although brendan fraser's girlfriend i swear i was gonna smack her like half that movie she's obnoxious i'm not gonna lie like and then like okay you're upset so you're just gonna throw a chair through a window because reasons because reasons like i don't know yeah she was probably the most obnoxious part of the film but the rest of it makes up for it next up is one that i remember watching on like tbs and stuff when i was it's probably a younger teenager which is war games with uh, Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy. Wait. No. Yeah, that is Ali Sheedy. I just feel like a brain fart. <laughs> it's like one of those type names that you, you say and you're like, wait, was that right? Well, because in my mind, Ali Sheedy permanently looks like she looks like in The Breakfast Club. And so I did like a double take with like, wait, is that really who that is? Yeah, that is. Because <laughs> she doesn't look like that in this. Yeah, she's very much sans, um, what, lice and everything else? No, she didn't have lice. She had dandruff. But yeah, she had like the, you know, the, the, the dark shag hair and like the big drapey, like kind of yeah know, awkward I don't, clothes and this she's really cute i don't know in 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 that movie she she's just so disgusting looking that like i yeah i, I would picture that she would have lies too anyway that's neither here nor there um this <laughs> sidebar is, this is a really fun movie and i actually forgot how enjoyable it was um 
if this isn't one you're, one you're familiar with and you like kind of um, computer geeky sort of things, it's a really fun one for that. Because um, basically Matthew Broderick's character likes to mess around with computers and has, you know, figured out how to do some hacking type of stuff. Mainly just to get games and stuff to have fun with and to change his grades. Um, but Yeah, he, let, let's skip over that. In the process of trying to find a game, he accidentally stumbles upon... Um, War Games, which is actually a program that was put together by someone who had worked for the military to basically play out scenarios of an actual war um, and accidentally s almost starts a real war in the process. A nuclear war, yes. which would kill everyone <laughs> and everything on this earth. Um, no big deal. But it was a very good movie, and I'm glad that we got it on physical media. Absolutely. And and this looks like the first time I watched this. I know you'd seen it before. Mm -hmm. This was actually one that I hadn't seen. Normally, we're kind of talking the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really love this movie. It was a lot of fun. And I'm, like, sitting there going, like, why would you have something so easily accessible? Like, if it can literally do that. Like, I did not, like, the stupidity that they displayed throughout that film that, the, like, you know, the U.S. military and all the scientists involved with that, it was just like, why? But I think that probably in, you know, another 30, 40 years, they'll say the same thing about things now of people that are able to hack certain things. It's just all about perspective. Our perspective of technology and what it's able to do is so much different than it would have been in, what, 1980-something? Um, 1983. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, truth be told, I, I kind of look at this, and I then I look at that one Star Trek episode where they basically did virtual warfare, and you're know, like, oh, like you know, they basically played like Battleship. Oh, this sector got hit. You need to go, you know, exterminate yourself, or basically, it's like, it's kind of the same idea, like the whole idea of fighting a theoretical war, but it never takes into account the fact that actual human lives are at stake. Yeah, because the computer actually takes over the real like defense stuff so. and things get serious but mm -hmm. it was very enjoyable and uh definitely one we'll watch again this is one that i watched by myself and you absolutely would have no part in it whatsoever because i've seen it before and it's a no thank you yeah and, and this was actually one that either i thought i had seen but then as i watched it, i was like nope i haven't seen this one before so uh, but i watched dawn of the dead the Zack Snyder remake. And I basically, I had heard from, I thought I had seen it. And I honestly, I can't remember now, but I remember you just talking horribly about it over the years. And so part of me just was like, eh, not interested. We picked this up as part of our vacation haul. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot because I did love the original. And I'm now really sad that I waited so long. I loved this movie. And it makes sense because I love most of Zack Snyder's films. So it makes sense that I would love this one too. And it comes through in spades. It is definitely a lot ickier, to quote you. But I loved it. And I thought that it was, uh, outside of, you know, like a zombie attack and them hiding out the mall, nothing else is like what it is in... Um, in the original Dawn of the Dead, George Romero's Dawn of the Dead from 1978, even the ending, you know, on the in with uh, the original Dawn of the Dead, it it ends on a lot more hopeful note. This one is a lot more of a downer note, definitely. And so I love Zack Snyder's style with this. That yeah, you know, he just has he has such a gift with visuals, and it shines through here. And once again, just another thing in the column that says I love Zack Snyder absolutely 100. percent But I know that you have different thoughts, and I will be more than happy to hear them now. Well, for, first of all, back when I first saw this, it was I don't know when did this get released. It probably wasn't all that long. Ago. Early 2000s, like mid 2000s. I probably saw this in like 2006. I had never heard of Zack Snyder before in my life. I had never seen a zombie movie before in my life. I don't recommend starting with that one yeah i would definitely recommend going back to like you know night of the living dead or dawn of the dead or like the original dawn of the dead or something I like that was, i wouldn't like, start there traumatized and wouldn't watch a zombie movie for like ever yeah it took you a while <laughs> to even like come back to certain things like shawn of the dead or something like that mm -hmm. yeah you kind of had to ease me back into it and still now i'm kind of cherry picking which ones i'm willing to watch or rewatch, depending on if you get me to watch something and i'm like nope not again <laughs> so but you know like again i I'm, I'm really happy with this with watching this film now and this definitely is going to make it in the rotation at least for me anyway next up is a box set we bought like on black friday like two years ago and we started watching it finally so we watched the first lethal weapon and i don't know if i had ever seen the first one i 
I feel like it's one of those that, like, it's so iconic that you you know certain things about it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if I'd actually sat down and watched any of them. But we bought it Black Friday a while ago. Yeah, and there's one of these I know I've seen all or most of. Um, I just don't remember which one it is. I just remember, like, particular scenes from it. But mm-hmm. it was not the first one. Um, but it's a fun one. And uh, Mel Gibson is a special kind of crazy sometimes, I tell you. Exactly. And, you know, it's definitely, you know, I know that that, uh, especially it, and I think the second one are regarded as really well done, iconic kind of 80s action buddy cop kind of movies. And it definitely holds up to that. And it does, um, it's really good. It's really fun. And a lot of great action, and it hits the right, you know, emotional beats, and it's just a lot of fun. Also, special uh, shout out that Eric Clapton does most of the scoring there, which I thought was a cool kind of thing to hear that iconic guitar work there through. So it was, it was a lot of fun. This one here's another one that I watched uh, without you uh, because you know you were needing to, I think you were needing to do some school work or something like that. Uh, but uh, I watched another John Carpenter film, one that kind of runs against what he's known for. He's known for, you know, basically kind of horror, more edgier kind of stuff. But this is an Elvis biopic starring Kurt Russell. And before you're like, okay, how does this work? This was done two years after Elvis died. So I had a lot of questions about it myself. Like, what can you do with, you know, two years after Elvis died? Like, what can you get away with on a made-for-TV biopic with John Carpenter starring Kurt Russell? Um, I'm here to report that Kurt Russell's performance, of course, he's actually played Elvis in other movies or like an Elvis impersonator or Elvis himself in other movies. He does a great job as Elvis. He actually does. And it's kind of weird because, you know, I'm used to thinking Kurt Russell in other roles, but him actually playing the king here is he does great. Uh, I think John Carpenter viewed this film very much as a homage to Elvis and very much he's looking at Elvis through rose-colored glasses because I read somewhere that he's a big fan of Elvis. It's very clear that he was looking through rose-colored glasses, probably colored with the fact that it was only two years after Elvis died. You don't get a whole lot of the seedier side of things that Elvis was, you know, of course the drug use, everything else. It basically ends right as Elvis is starting his residency in Las Vegas. So there's just not a whole lot of ground that it covers in that regard. And everything is just viewed in a very nice kind of way. And there's certain things that are kind of iffy that kind of go into that a little bit, but overall it's very much a, a rose colored film and and tribute to Elvis. But in that regard, you know, the music's great. The, you know, everything else is great. Um, and Kurt Russell performs very well in it. So it's, it's definitely a rewatch, Uh, But you just have to understand that you're not going to get, like, the hard-hitting, this-is-how-it-went-down kind of feel with it. Up next is The Librarian. And this we watched the first of three. These are, um, if you don't know these, they were originally on TNT. They were TNT made-for-TV movies. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first one is Quest for the Spear, uh, stars Noah Wiley. They're such fun movies. Um, Of course, they definitely have a little bit of a cheese factor to them because they were, like, made-for-TV kind of um, a slightly more bumbling type of like Indiana Jones type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but really fun. This, we did have a funny little moment with this though. I think this, we decided this came out of the Netherlands or something. It did. Uh, and we, like we started playing it and all of the ads and stuff at the beginning were in Dutch. And then we got to the movie and I was like, I swear if this is not in English, I'm going to cry. And it wasn't English. They had Dutch subtitles on, which we had to turn off, but it was a whole thing. It was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> And then it's like we start looking at the back and it's all in it's all in Dutch, like all the the things on the back. And so we're like, yeah, that we probably should have known that, that was coming. Yes. Apparently this movie was like this, this set is not available like U.S. made or anything. So we had to get it from overseas. Apparently we didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's cool. I mean, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, Bob Newhart's great in this as well. Yes. But I mean, and what's her name? Jane? Yeah, I forget who. What's her name? I don't know. But anyway, like, yeah, she's great in it, but and yeah, overall, it's pretty good. In the last video, I discussed that I had watched Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2 and was then going to watch Army of Darkness very soon. And I did. So, um, 
Loved it. It was great. Right along with the other Evil Dead movies. Now I, you know, want to go in and watch uh, or get a hold of Ash vs. Evil Dead and just kind of complete that storyline. Although, you know, I can definitely understand that, you know, Evil Dead, the first Evil Dead is kind of its own thing and then they kind of soft rebooted for the second one. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to get the other ones because, I mean, Ash is just amazing and awesome and uh, I just, I want more. So, and I know that you really don't want any part of it, so that's okay. I've seen Army of Darkness before. It was another one I got subjected to during college. Um, it, it, why? <laughs> I I will disagree. I thought it was great. But I also think that watching the other movies, which are a lot ickier, which you probably wouldn't watch anyway, so it's I just don't think it's for you. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Somehow my icky factor just didn't work with this movie, and I think it's because the story is so solid otherwise. But it chapter one. Mm. This movie is clearly grody, like parts of it anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I wouldn't say it's like overly gory in most of it, but I mean, there definitely has its moments. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what saves this movie for me is it's the relationship between the kids and the story that that is all being told there. And I think the yucky stuff is spread out enough that I can kind of forgive it a little bit. Like I'm not yeah. looking at constant like you know blood and gore and grossness. It's just like intermittent, so it's not quite as bad. Um, this is another one I remember watching in the theater, which I think we had to go to like a midnight showing or something mm -hmm. because it was sold out the first show. Um, we saw it on opening night, I think, and we got to the end of it and it was like chapter one and I was like, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> that's not the whole movie. Yeah, there's more. There's more coming. Because <laughs> I, again, this is another thing I really didn't know anything about except that there was a creepy clown in it. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that say that, you know, the original, like the TV miniseries, one starring Tim Curry, is better. And I know there's a lot of people online that have serious problems with with these movies, especially Chapter Two. Uh, but overall, I think I think it is the better choice. Um, I think if you didn't have Tim Curry in the first one, then this one would be by far run away just completely better. And really, there wouldn't be anything redeemable about the about the 1990 miniseries. But uh, I, I really love the first one. I think the second one does a good job as well. Uh, but I always think the kid's story with it is going to be the more interesting of the two anyway. I just thought the way that they translated, like, you know, all the things that had happened to them in the 27 years that it had been since they last saw each other in part two was really cool. And the actors they got to play the kids were phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. And I, th I thought it was great. I thought that the TV miniseries, like, it's not bad, but it just kind of drags. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, so that, that's sometimes what happens with... TV miniseries, even back, I mean, especially back then, I think they've gotten far better in the kind of limited, you know, mini series kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They've gotten far better at doing that here in the last 10 to 15 years. But back then it did, it kind of felt like it was like, you know, you're kind of looking at your watch a little bit like, okay, when's Tim Curry going to show back up? Well, and the other thing is, I think it was, you know, a victim of the limitations of its time. It was, if it was made for TV, it was actually on TV. It wasn't like a made for Netflix miniseries or a made for HBO miniseries. It was like on cable, you know, so they couldn't do just anything. Yeah, and there are limitations, whether they be, you know, ratings wise or special effects wise, which that's, again, that's what, you know, this one definitely has in its favor. So, but I, uh, yeah, adored it. You know, it's definitely a, a must watch every Halloween season. Speaking of John Carpenter, because I feel like. He's a pretty frequent one that comes up, uh, but I also had more films to kind of go through, so I watched In the Mouth of Madness. I'm going to tell you something. This one I hadn't actually heard about until, like, last year, until whenever I really started, like, trying to look at John Carpenter and collecting most of his filmography and had no clue what I was in for. And then I watched it. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> this movie is bonkers and awesome. Uh, th I don't know if I can really describe it well. Uh, it's just essentially, if, if you've liked a lot of John Carpenter's films, or if you like horror in general, and you haven't heard of this film, just watch it. You'll love it. Oh, it's inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm reading the back of this as he's sitting here talking. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't watch this with me. I didn't. Yeah, um, it's very much, yeah, there's definitely a Lovecraftian bent to this. Uh, very much so. And it is really great. Sam Neill kills it. This may be my favorite Sam Neill movie. I love Sam Neill. Yeah, I mean, he just, he's absolutely amazing in it. 
everything in this is just stellar. I think it's absolutely one of John Carpenter's best. I know I say that usually with every film, but like there's definitely tiers to John Carpenter. This is in the upper tier. This is up there with Halloween. This is up there with The Fog. This is up there with The Thing, uh, you know, Escape from New York, like all those like really great films that he did. This is definitely up there with them. I highly recommend it. Okay, so next up is one of my absolute favorites. Um, partially, I think, because I have a crush on Daniel Radcliffe in this movie. <laughs> His hair is epic. It is. Epic, epic hair. And he looks so good in these period clothes. But The Woman in Black, um, also based off of a book, which I read and think this is better. If that says anything The to movie you. might be better than the book. I mean, apparently the book's a classic, and I want to say it came out in the 80s. Um, but, yeah, I read it last year, I think it was. And it's, like, it's good, but I like the way this was this better. Um, this is definitely bleaker than the book, though, as far as endings and all that go. Because um, in the book, he does actually live through all of this to tell about it. Um, in, in this, that is not the case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you, know, you actually watched this one before I did, because you, yes. oh, you were oh over gosh. at my parents' house, and I was doing something, I can't remember, but, you know, they... They picked it and watched it with you, and you loved it. Yeah, well, I picked it. Oh, you did? Yeah, I picked it. You picked it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, was on, it was on Amazon Prime, I think. But that is the first movie in my whole life I remember yelping out loud when it got to a certain point. There definitely are some kind of jump moments in it. I would say that movie probably relies about 70% on jump scares. <laughs> but I think the thing that it does really well in setting up those is that the atmosphere. It's mm -hmm. one thing to have jump scares. It's another thing to set at really creepy... Kind of honestly, very dreadful kind of atmosphere, and that's what this does so well. I think it justifies the jump scares as opposed to just okay, we're kind of just going along, and then something happens. It's like you can feel it's coming, and then when it does, it's just like it kind of confirms. You're just kind of waiting for a win. Well, and it's really eerie too because they put like the woman in black in the backgrounds of so many so, so many shots, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily like focus on her so like she's like he's you know sitting there reading through paperwork and you're like it's a close-up shot of him but then over his shoulder like kind of blurred in the background you can see her like standing there and like creeping toward him slowly and then something will happen and she'll be gone mm -hmm. and so it's just it's it's very um tense but it's very good yeah and it's yeah i love it anytime you pick it i'm like fantastic absolutely in for it and you know dan radcliffe what can I say? He's he's kind of moved beyond the whole Harry Potter thing. He's become a great actor. I mean, I'm thinking about different things I've seen him in. He just kind of kills it, and he just kind of does stuff. It's like he's got all the money in the world. He can just do whatever he wants. So yeah, he's definitely got some creative freedom there. So he doesn't he doesn't need to make the money. No, definitely. <laughs> all right, so I completed the View Askew universe by watching Jay and Silent Bob reboot, and I feel like this movie. If you're looking to turn someone on to Kevin Smith's movies, this is not the film to do it with. Um, this really harkens back to previous movies, and it really harkens back on the kind of shared mythology within those films. So it's not the one that you're going to go to. Uh, I will say as a fan of those movies and having watched this film, I enjoyed this film a lot. It's not a. You know, a lot of people think that as Kevin Smith's gotten older, he is he's not that. He's gotten not very good at making films. I disagree with that. I just think that he's making films that kind of entertain him. And if you're already a fan of his movies, you're already going to be entertained by it. But he's not looking to win anybody else over at this point because I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was really funny, and um, I thought it actually showed Jay growing up a bit, which I know after so many movies is kind of a shock. Uh, but I thought it overall did a great job. And I think it also did a great job of talking about kind of the fan culture around a lot of stuff going on nowadays, you know, because I mean, we're definitely in a period of, you know, the, the nerds have inherited the earth. And now it's just this big behemoth, whereas, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, kind of a lot of these fandoms were kind of considered the underdogs. Now they're these huge money-making enterprises. So I think it does a good job of commenting on a lot of that and sort of like the dark and greedy reboot kind of 
that, that really swept through, especially like the mid two thousands, like up to, to through to today. I still think it's a problem today, but uh, I think overall it, it does a great job, and it's just it's a fun movie. So next up is one we watch quite a lot around here, and that's Man of Steel, um, with Henry Cavill, who is the most perfect looking Superman ever. I, I mean, I, like I said, I've done a uh, D's Nerds watch on this. One of my favorite movie. One of my favorite. I mean, he's definitely, I think, the best Superman. I, no offense to Christopher Reeve. I just the more I watch this, the more I just I can't, I can't say no to Henry Cavill. I think he's just stellar in it. I think a lot of the things that in this film work really well, and I think it's one of those things that as you watch it and time goes on, it's more appreciated as it goes on. And I just think it's one of the better comic book films to come out in the last ten years. It's still great. It works really well. You, you probably would figure out by now, I, I like John Carpenter. I don't, I don't know if you figured that out. If you haven't, I don't know what else to tell you. But I watched Prince of Darkness. I've heard of this one referred to as a very, as Carpenter's underrated classic. I'm kind of inclined to agree. Very, very good film. Very creepy. Uh, I mean, it's just got a lot going for it. And... I'm kind of surprised that you know it's kind of considered it really wasn't that successful and really wasn't that heralded when it came out. I mean, you know, it just it's just really good. I can't I can't say anything else, you know, that really can you know add anything else to it. It's just amazing. It's just another great Carpenter movie, and it's up in that upper echelon again. Carpenter is amazing. So next up is Batman v Superman. Um. With Wonder Woman, who steals it? I would just like to say that. Yeah, and uh, we've <laughs> talked about this before that you know because of Zach's because of the Snyder Cut that this movie's really grown in your eyes. It has. Um, the Snyder Cut made a lot of difference in how I saw certain sequences in this movie, particularly like the uh, what's it called? The nightmare sequence. The nightmare sequence. Yeah. yeah, which made like zero sense to me at all, and I think he was explained it to me like four or five times at this point. Um, and could kind of make me make sense out of it, but having actually seen it play the rest of the way out in the Snyder Cut, it was like, oh! Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I again, I've done another D's Nerds watch on it. I love it. It's amazing. If you really want to get more of my thoughts on it, uh, you know, you can watch that video. But, I mean, come on. I mean, there, like I said, there's some things that I don't like, but as I keep watching this movie those things just keep shrinking and it's to the point now where I, I I just I don't really have any complaints. It's it's a stellar movie. And Wonder Woman and her theme song steal it, I swear. That is definitely one of the coolest moments in the entire film is her entrance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, is she with you? I thought she was with you. <laughs> I mean just the fact, you know, when when Batman is like dead to rights, you know, Doomsday's got him and then, you know, the I beams come out, they get blocked, you know, the lights too blinding out there, and then all of a sudden it cuts and there's Wonder Woman, the theme song hits and then bam, we're off and running. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Her theme song is just perfect. Yeah, it's I I can't think of a better theme song that's come out in the last ten years than that. I mean it's just it's so perfect. Mm -hmm. This next one is one that I watched while Michelle read and I think she really resented me for it because I subjected her to it. But um I it's it's Purple Rain by Prince. Come on. The thing was every time I looked up it was like what the what what is even happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's I mean I I love this film. I love the music in this film. It's just and surprisingly Prince pulls it off although I will say there was a really funny moment that happened <laughs> watching this it's like I'm because the only time I ever watched this movie is like when it was um, on like VH1 or something like that and so I really liked it but I didn't realize that, that there was nudity in this film and so it was just like you know, like, you're watching, you know, you're just watching it's going on like normal, and then all of a sudden Apollonia's in there and, like, just bears all, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> it was just like, didn't see it coming. About that time Charlotte comes running in, and I'm like, oh, duh, duh, duh. <laughs> Pause, turn it off, and you go away. <laughs> it was so bad. But I was like, I, and Michelle's looking at me like, what's going on? It's like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. So, but, I mean... It, overall, I like the music is great in it, and I think the story moves along well enough that it gets to the musical parts and works. It's I wouldn't say it's like the greatest movie ever, but when you take into account the music that's coming along with it, including the title track, 
She hates Purple Rain. I still don't know why. It's one of my favorite songs ever. And it's a song that, you know, as whenever I had a band, I would, you know, that's usually what I closed the shows we played with. It's a, I mean, I love it. And it's really fun. But I know you're going to have, you know, kind of blah things to think about, especially because you really don't like that song. I don't know. I just, every time I looked up at what was happening in that movie while I was trying to read it, I just felt like I was that Jackie Chan meme where he's just like, <laughs> well, you know, that's okay. No worries. Okay, so next up is a perfect classic, Dracula. And we just watched the first one, the original one, um, from 1931. And I love it. Bela Lugosi. What else can be said? Yes. And um, this one, I like. he's awesome in it, obviously, but Renfield, man... Yeah. Renfield is the unsung hero of this movie. <laughs> He's and so his crazy. crazy eyes. Thousands and thousands of rats. Millions of them. <laughs> it's, oh, man. Just, and, you know, like, there's a lot of talk about um, that I've always seen, you know, different videos and stuff about. Of course, they had the Spanish version that they filmed the exact same time with the exact same sets. And everybody talks about that technically, a lot of the, the things that they did in the Spanish movie is better than what they did in this version. But this version has Bela Lugosi, and it has uh, Dwight, Dwight Fry as Renfield. And quite honestly, that beats anything technical that the Spanish movie does. The Spanish movie is very good, but when you have those two performances... Come on, this ain't this isn't even a competition. So I'm actually a huge John Wayne fan, and it comes back from like you know my dad was a huge John Wayne fan, my grandpa was a huge John Wayne fan, my cousin's a huge John Wayne fan. Like it's just kind of a family thing. They like we're all into John Wayne, and so I picked this up on DVD because quite frankly I've always wanted it on physical media, but I kept waiting for a Blu-ray. But I was like, you know what? It's five bucks. I'll go ahead and do it, and I watched The Shootist. John Wayne's last movie and I think that this is one of the the Duke's absolute best uh, this is actually one that my father being the big John Wayne fan he is he hates it huh. will not watch it he is definitely from the school of he sees John Wayne as like you know the hero and you know the white hat and really doesn't like he and his main reason why he hates it is because he dies at the end oh and so he doesn't want anything to do with it. And so, uh, but I disagree with my father. I think it's actually one, absolutely one of his best roles. And uh, I think that it's one of his best movies. And it definitely, it kind of got me on a John Wayne kick. And I forgot to grab it, actually. But I also watched Cahill, United States Marshal, which is another really, really good one that was kind of from his early, you know, kind of later period. So uh, I love John Wayne. I'm probably going to be watching some more John Wayne kind of here and there because you know, it, it's good to revisit every now and then just kind of for nostalgia purposes. Speaking of movies we forgot to grab off the shelf, we recently watched The Mummy with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Wise, which is an absolute classic, and he laughed at me because I kept quoting the whole thing as I watched it. But hey, I mean, it's... <laughs> I, I know it too by heart. I mean, geez, I've watched that as a kid Lord knows how many times, but I i mean, it's just another reason to love Brendan Fraser. I mean, I, Brendan Fraser's kind of having a comeback moment now, which is amazing. It's like, why did he ever leave? Because he's always been awesome. Yeah, I love that movie. That was um, one of the movies that made me fall in love with the idea of archaeology. And I actually was an archaeology major for a time in college. So, like, all of these, like, you know, Indiana Jones, The Mummy, The Librarian movies, those all kind of fed that monster a little bit. And I really loved it. But, yes, I can quote, like, most of that movie. And I don't think I realized exactly how much I could quote until we watched it the last time. <laughs> I am a librarian. <laughs> so, the last one I got here is... Um... It's by this guy. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name's John Carpenter. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, okay? I like John Carpenter. And this is what I actually want to show you because this one's actually really good. And uh, I, I'd seen parts of it before, I think. Because, like, I remembered, like, the big epic fight scene and everything. But I don't, I don't know. But, like, it basically felt like I was watching it new now. But it was, they live! Man! And this dude, this dude is just amazing. I love John Carpenter. I mean, this and this one is such a huge message movie talking about, uh, you know, capitalism and, you know, kind of the whole 
thing behind the mechanisms behind that that keep us buying things and how that all works. Uh, it's very fascinating movie, and I think it actually has a pretty deep message to go into. Uh, man, and and it's also got like the longest fist fight in the history of cinema. I mean, there's just like an eight minute brawl between these two dudes just having at it and you know it's been well parodied like especially south park did a great parody of it uh but yeah it's it's great and and i definitely want to watch again and actually i want to watch it with you because i think i think you might like this one too but is the fight as good as the mcclintock fight Ooh, 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 ooh. yeah that that big brawl there it, now that was just a big brawl between like you know probably 30 people. This is just two dudes just having at it. I mean, they're just absolutely beating the crap out of each other. It's stellar. Um, last but certainly not least is this wonderful man, Vincent Price. He is a national treasure. He is. And um, we've watched two of the movies out of here so far this spooky season. Um, we've watched The Pit and the Pendulum, which is, I think, arguably my favorite one. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the, good. And The Fall of the House of Usher, which is another favorite of mine. Um, the Pit and the Pendulum is interesting in that, really, in that particular movie, The Pit and the Pendulum, if you've ever actually read that story, there's really not much story. Mm -hmm. The whole story is the experience of the person who is, like, in the midst of dealing with this torture device. I mean, yeah. like, there's, that's the whole thing. Um, so they had to write an entire story to somehow incorporate that, which comes out really cool. It does. Um, it's a pretty, like, intricate story, really interesting, um... Where somehow Vincent Price ends up being both the hero and the villain at various points, and yeah, um, yeah, very cool. Um, and then Follow the House of Usher, of course, was definitely a more fleshed out story as far as that went. Um, and he, he's an infuriating character in that one, he's definitely the villain. I don't like him, <laughs> yeah, he's just but I mean, he, once again, I mean, he can carry these movies like nobody's mm -hmm. business, he is just, just a phenomenal actor. and Every time I watch his movies, it's just like, jeez, what a talent. If you ever get these sets, if you get your hands on them one way or another, you have to watch them with the introductions and like closing remarks from Vincent Price when he was doing these in the, it was the 80s, I think, mm -hmm. um, for yeah. Iowa Public Television of all things. Now, there is one thing with that. Um, this version, this volume one, went out of print with Scream Factory. They brought it back in print. But whenever they did that, they did some upgraded, uh, some like remastered versions of these films, so they do look a little better. But you lose the intros. They do not have those on the new set, so you do kind of have to do your research. Make sure if that's something that really matters to you, uh, to get the version that's out of print and try to find that. Otherwise, you're going to now, like I said, the updated one has better picture quality in some of these movies. So that might be worth it more to you. Just giving you for information purposes to us. We felt like their upgrade wasn't worth not having the intro. So we kept our original version. Yeah, because in his intros, he gives some really like insightful comments on like making the movies and, you know, certain choices that they made and how he worked with Roger Corman and all that stuff. And I just think it's it's almost like getting a little extra special feature before and after the movie. And I like it. And I think it just sets it sets the tone really well for watching those movies because mm -hmm. like it gets you in the right mood because he's in some castle somewhere with, you know, candles and it's lit really kind of eerily and, and and he's dressed looking like his dad herself and so it just it sets the tone for the movie and and it's to me that that's worth it all right so guys that's what we've been watching since our last one we're watching would love to know in the comments what you've been watching also would love to know which of these uh, that we watched was one of your favorites you know just let us know there also if you like what we're doing here at d's nerds you know just please subscribe to the channel click the bell icon so you we have new videos coming out also want to remind you that you know we now not only have d's nerds which covers mainly movies and different things of that nature but we also have d's nerds books which stars our lovely michelle here also d's nerds gaming which also stars michelle here as well and also d's music which covers my musical stuff that i'm doing and you know guitar related stuff i happen to be a guitar player go figure uh, so you know if you're interested in anything like that just subscribe to those channels as well and also we're on instagram facebook and twitter so if you're missing us in between videos you can follow us there and we also have merch and we have recently redesigned our merch so we have updated a lot of stuff in there and think we've put out some really cool stuff on there we've recently kind of purchased some 
some kind of samples that we want to get and kind of test it out make sure it looks good but if you're interested in, in supporting the channel in that way we're putting our link down in the description there so you know anything you buy just supports the channel and we really appreciate it so you know guys uh, you know we're past 300 subscribers this is kind of a cool deal for us as well I mean honestly I didn't know if we'd have you know a hundred people that would be interested in subscribing to us and we're at 300 so uh, we just really appreciate everything and um, you know, guys, until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Michelle. And this is D's Nerds. You guys have a great, safe rest of the day. Bye. Bye.